Ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening and welcome to the last in our fifth series of Doha Debates coming to you from the Gulf state of Qatar and sponsored by the Qatar Foundation. At some time or other, everyone wants to say about marriage. In the Islamic world, it's governed by a range of institutions and traditions, religion, law, family, culture, even politics. And somewhere on the list, love gets a look in as well. But should a woman be free to marry who she chooses? Or is it right that she should submit to other considerations? Do any or all of them outweigh personal choice about this most intimate of human relationships? Our motion tonight is that Muslim women should be free to marry anyone they choose. And we have four Muslims on our panel who will argue from very different points of view. Speaking for the motion, Azra Nomani, a writer and activist and the author of Standing Alone, an American woman's struggle for the soul of Islam. She's worked as a journalist and in 2003 she challenged the rules at her mosque that required women to enter and pray in separate areas. With her, Mohammed Habash, a Muslim cleric and a member of the Syrian parliament. He leads Friday prayers at the Al-Zakra Mosque in Damascus and is director of the city's Islamic Studies Center. Against the motion, Yasser Qadi, an American Muslim cleric who lectures throughout the English-speaking world. He studied at the Islamic University of Medina. He's an instructor at the Al Maghrib Institute and appears regularly on Islamic satellite channels. And with him, Thuraya Al Arayed, a Saudi writer, columnist, and poet. Her articles tackle current and controversial issues, maybe not quite as controversial as this one, and she's a member of the Arab Thought Foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, our panel. So now let me first call on Azra Nomani to speak for the motion. Thank you. This is a topic that I have meditated on for all of my adulthood. When I was a girl at the age of 18, reaching adulthood, I've confronted the barriers that just about every Muslim woman internalizes, that she doesn't have the right to choice when it comes to marriage. And I'm here as a 43-year-old woman now to tell you that I do not wish for any of the women that are here now or any of the women in our Muslim world to know the suffering, the loneliness, the loveless marriages, and the forced marriages that oftentimes come out of situations where a woman cannot make her own choice. Islam is a religion that believes in critical thinking. We are going to hear a lot of the theological arguments tonight that lay the barriers for women, that become the barriers around our heart. But what I would argue is that there are dissenting opinions. We have to remember that religion is not meant to bring about suffering. Religion is meant to lift our spirits. Marriage, what is it? It's about love. It's about passion. It's about kinship. All of our daughters of Islam deserve this. All of them deserve to make their own choices about their destiny. It took me 25 years. I went into a marriage that I thought would make my family happy. And I could not fool myself when I lay my head to bed at night. Because in that most intimate place, it is you alone who lies there. It is not your family. It is not your tribe. It is not your country. Every night, I cried myself to sleep. And I could not stay in this marriage because I knew that I, as a Muslim woman, was, had a right to happiness. And my salvation came because my family, me, my family gave me the greatest message that there is, which is that we respect you, we have mercy on you, and we honor your own choice. This is what we should do for our daughters in Islam. We should allow them the right to choose whom they can marry, and that right should extend to anyone. Azra Nomani, thank you very much thank indeed. You. Isn't it because women's rights have been abused in many parts of the Islamic world that you need the protection of Islam, you need the protection of family, you need the protection of governments, you need them to have a say in the marriage process? In Gulf governments, for instance, in Qatar, you have a government official who will sit with a woman before she marries, talk to her, if necessary, without the family, to make sure that she is entering the marriage of her own free will. That's the kind of protection you'd approve of, isn't it? He's not going to be in the bedroom, is he? 
for the next 50 years. We're not talking about that. And we're talking about right, the but what state we're providing about protection. If you want it on the one hand, you can't exclude them from the marriage process on the other, can you? You can because ultimately the state is not going to be in the marriage. It is only that woman who's going to be in the marriage. But you and want the state to pick up the pieces if something goes wrong, don't you? We want the state to be able to protect the equal rights of the women in divorce, in issues of assault, in issues of alimony, in issues of custody. So you want them, but you don't want them. You want the family to provide support if something goes wrong, don't you? You want them to provide the safety net as well. And yet you're saying, stay out of the decision-making process. I'm a mother. I have a son. And trust me, I wish only well, just like the state, just like the families. Everybody in this room, everybody on this panel, I know has the best intentions. But at the end of the day, what I argue is that the choice rests with the woman. And choice is so good? No lonely, loveless marriages in the West where you have all the choice that you want? The choices? And, and, and no safety net either? The choices bring about cost. There's no doubt. And with rights come responsibilities. And the, there comes a need, there is a very important need to be wise. But ultimately, the counsel of family can only go so far. It cannot dictate to a girl what she should do. All right, Azra Nomani, thank, thank you, you very much indeed. Thank you. Now let me ask Yasser Kadi to speak against the motion, please. Thanks, Tim. The motion up for debate asks us to allow Muslim women the freedom to marry whomever they please. I'm against this motion because it is inherently illogical and self-contradictory. A Muslim literally translates as one who submits, meaning to the laws of God. Therefore, a Muslim, regardless of the gender, is completely free to marry within the allowances of those laws. If they contravene those laws, then by definition they are not submitting. In other words, they are not exemplifying faithful Muslims. Now, this is not to deny the very real problems of our society, some of which uh, Asra referred to, of forced marriages, of tribal and, and cultural prejudices that unjustly prevent women from getting married. It is an undeniable fact that women are oppressed in many parts of our world, sometimes in the name of our religion. We all agree sitting here that there's a serious problem, that sometimes in the name of the religion, Muslim women are being subjugated. However, I'm arguing that those subjugations are cultural norms that many times oppose Islamic law. And I admit that sometimes Islamic clerics themselves, a part of their culture, propagate those norms and exacerbate the problem rather than solving them. But I remind you that the motion is not arguing for greater freedom for women's rights. If it were, I would be a supporter of the motion. Rather, it is arguing for unconditional freedom. And that is why I oppose it. A Muslim woman cannot marry a non-Muslim man. Neither can a woman marry another woman. And of course, let us not forget that Islamic law also puts restrictions on men as well. The point is that if a, woman, if a man or woman wishes to identify with Islam, if they want to call themselves Muslims, there are some boundaries for that definition. Anyone who argues for ultimate freedom is arguing to destroy those boundaries. In conclusion, this motion makes just about as much sense as someone who says Muslim men should be given the freedom to drink anything they want, including alcohol. We all agree there's a problem. There's a serious problem. The solution to this problem lies not in rejecting the prophetic message, especially if we call ourselves Muslims. The solution lies in rediscovering the true prophetic message, in educating the people about it, and in properly following it. Thanks a lot. Yes, sir. Yes, Akari, thank you very much indeed. If a Muslim man can marry a non-Muslim woman, then clearly there is no doctrinal bar in Islam to a man and a woman of different faiths being together. Why does it matter which one is Muslim and which isn't? Well, Tim, uh, the law has already been formulated, and the law is quite explicit in this regard that there are slightly different laws for men and women. Well, Hassan and Tarabi, a conservative Islamic scholar and politician in Sudan, said he could see nothing in the Quran or the Sunnah that forbade Muslim women from marrying either Christians or Jews. That is his position and he's free to hold it. But as he holds this position, he should also realize that there has been unanimous consensus in the previous generations, and I have plenty of quotes that I can give you, uh, and unanimous consensus is the strongest evidence in Islamic law. He that says a Muslim that all lady the past fatwas that prohibit 
the marriage of Muslim women to non-Muslim men were issued during periods in which there were political disputes between Muslims and non-Muslims. But Tim, that's his position. And the vast majority of Muslim scholarship disagrees with what's him wrong, on this premise. What's wrong with that position? Because it goes against the Islamic uh, unanimous consensus. And according it's not, to... Well, it's clearly not unanimous, is well, it? I mean, well, there are well, other well, people who share you're, his views. You're now discussing the minutiae of the methodology of Islamic law. And by and large, once a unanimous consensus is established, it cannot be broken by a later position. You, One position. you, you really think that it's God's will here and now in the 21st century that if a Muslim woman can find a happy, loving and respectful marriage with someone from a different faith, that God is saying to her she should give it up purely on religious grounds. I, I, I throw the question back at you, Tim, and say, what if she found well, a happy, people loving... People aren't, people aren't interested well, in my answer. I know, okay, but can I'm, you broadening, answer this one? I'm broadening the issue. That's why we asked you to come here and talk, because they're more I interested in what you've I got to say than That's what I That's why my voice is being heard. But, what if I were to broaden the question and say, what if a woman finds this love and happiness in another woman? If why do you, she wants why do you to find be, so much difficulty in answering this particular question? No, because the point is very simple. It's a question of self-identity. If she wants to be a Muslim, she should follow the laws of Islam. If she doesn't want to follow the laws of Islam, she should not call herself a Muslim. So be better a Muslim marriage that falls apart, as so many do these days, than a happy and successful mixed marriage. Even though I'm from Texas, I don't follow the Bush doctrine of either with us or against us. There are many shades of gray in between. And I you can and you I can find... I wasn't asking you for an either or, but, but, you, you, know, can but you know that many Muslim marriages end in failure. The solution is not to allow them to marry anybody whom they please. The solution is to re-educate them with the proper Islamic if, methodology. If a Christian woman is married to a Christian man and she converts to Islam in the course of her marriage, is she supposed then to divorce her husband? This is an issue that has been disagreed upon in classical Islam and in Oh, modern so Islam. there is some give in the in, position. If, if a person converts after the marriage contract has taken place, there is leeway. There is give. All right, Yasser Qadi, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Let me please ask Mohammed Habash now to speak for the motion. Yeah. Uh, I believe Islam have given the woman full human rights and uh, respect her choice about uh, her marriage. Uh, it's very clear in Islam there is no compulsion in religion. That means there is no compulsion in prayer, there is no compulsion in fasting, there is no compare, uh, compulsion in uh, pilgrimage, there is no compulsion in, in marriage. Because of that, we believe the woman in Islam has a right to choose her uh, spouse. In the same time, that not means we as a family or as a society has no responsibility, no moral responsibility to advise her or to guide her or to lead her to the best situation. We have to remember that Prophet Muhammad peace upon him when he received some lady, his name uh, her name uh, Asma bin Kazid ibn II, she came to Prophet Muhammad peace upon him and she told him, my father forced me to marry someone I don't like him. Prophet Muhammad said directly, he has no right to force you, but this is your right. She said, I agree with my father, but I would like to show all women around the world that fathers has no right to force their daughters. This is our choice. This is what the companions of Prophet Muhammad upon him around him uh, tell us. In the same time, we have moral responsibility to uh, correct, to protect our daughters, to protect our sisters. If my daughter chose someone, some person on drugs, me, I have, I have a right to reject this kind of uh, marriage, but I have no right at all to uh, force her more than this. Mohammed Habash, thank you very much indeed. Aren't you treating Islam a little like a tree where you pick the fruits that you like and leave the ones that you don't? This is a central principle that you're ignoring. You ignore a few more central principles in Islam and what are you left with? I'm not talking about the uh, religion. It's not conditioned to, uh, to leave your religion and to convert into Islam. But you can't it's just pick and choose the bits that you like. Yes, but you? You, have, you have to be uh, clear as far as democracy is concerned, the president has to respect all faiths in his people. You cannot, uh, as democracy, as far as democracy is concerned, the president has to respect the faith of his people. So the husband has to respect the faith of 
uh, all families. But in, in, the, in a marriage issue, the family has rights as well, doesn't it? The family has a right to protect its reputation, its honour, its standing in the community. Yes. And marriage is central to all that. So aren't the wishes of the family even more important than one individual in that family? Yes. It might be 20 people, it might be a closed society. The, fam the only currency the family has is its honor. Yes, I'm talking about the family and about the society that this is the, the common responsibility, more responsibility for all we have to so look... So shouldn't the family have the right to limit the woman's choice? Yes, yes, you I think agree they with should. this point. Yes, I agree with this point. So you're not challenging that at all? Are you on the right side of the debate? <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> all right, Mohamed Habash, thank you very much. <laughs> and now let me please ask uh, Thuraya Alaraya to speak against the motion. I'm not going to speak on religious grounds because I'm not an expert on that and my friend here took that part. I'm going to speak as a person, as a mother, as a woman, as an Arab who happens to be a Muslim, educated, studied education, and is very much concerned with the consequences of the choices the individuals make on the rest of the society, including the family. Freedom is a beautiful concept with hazy, sometimes conflicting definitions. I see it as a two-edged tool that can, if used without skill or wisdom, hurt somebody. Freedom must have embedded controls against abuse or misuse or hurting others. Youth, generally, under the age of, say, 25-27, are not the most wise or experienced just by fact of their age and their feelings. They go by attraction, which is virtually, usually evoked physically at that stage and need to be satisfied with the shortest possible wait. But marriage should not be limited to the role of a quick fix solution. It is important. It impacts more than the two individuals that are there involved in any individual choice. A marriage threatened by failure because it is crossing any boundaries or any differences between the husband and the wife is not... You're going to have to wind you up. Yes, now, it doesn't have much of a chance for success. And a marriage that starts with the problem of displeasing somebody has to be defending itself forever. All right, Soraya Alaray, thank you very much indeed. Your basic message to young people, uh, particularly young Muslim women, since that's who we're talking about, is mother knows best, isn't it? No. That's what I mean, you seem to be saying. No. Uh, they're young, the Mother sometimes don't know best. Sometimes Concentrating she has on physical attraction and you need to have a say that's in a the basic, marriage. That's a basic psychology concept. When you are young, it's your physical needs that drive you. And I think everybody agrees with me. Well, the mothers in Saudi Arabia aren't doing a good job, are they? Because according to the Saudi Khalij Times in June 2006, the rate of divorce increased in the country by 20% in 2003 alone. I think the rate of divorce is rising in the whole world, not just in the Muslim So maybe world. the restrictions that are being put on Saudi women here and their choices of marriage are not no, leading them the, to a happy it's life, the rise are they? of education in the, in the Muslim women and in the Saudi women and the Arab women. She now thinks that she has a role that is different. She doesn't want to be the one who sacrifices to make the... But if she is better work. educated than her parents, and mm -hmm. in many cases she is these days, doesn't that give her the right to, to decide who she's going to marry? Yes. It provided, does. provided, well, it's a two-sided issue. She's got to keep no. her family happy, she's got to keep religion happy, she's got to keep the courts you happy, the government happy. You do not have one side decide for her? the other. It's an issue that both sides, it has to be a win-win situation. And so right. unless everybody wins, the woman in question can't? No, she's included in everyone. She's included, of yeah. Of course. But she, if she decides differently and from the, the others, too bad. No, seriously. Too bad. Seriously, let me finish one statement. 
You've finished many? No, no, I did not. <laughs> Usually, you look, and this is another psychology concept, you look at the results afterwards and you think, why God, if I had married that guy, what would have my life been? And you feel so happy, you listened. Okay, Thuraya Alaraya, thank you very much indeed. We're going to throw the matter open to the audience for your questions. The motion is this House believes that Muslim women should be free to marry anyone they choose. And I'm going to take a question from the lady in the third row there. Yes, you. Hello, I'm Palestinian from Seattle, Washington. Uh, Dr. Habash, uh, you mentioned how, I quote, it is not a compulsion to pray, not a compulsion to fast, etc. And you also add that we should reevaluate and take another look at the Quran and include people of scriptures, i.e. Jews and Christians, under the group of people Muslim women should be allowed to marry. However, as Yasir Qadi said, um, not only is there a unanimous consensus that it, is, and that it is essentially haram to do that, as Muslim women are only allowed to marry um, men of the Islamic faith, so how can you say that we should reevaluate the word of God and a hadith which specifically state we are not allowed to? Should we not rather choose to marry someone within the bounds set by our religion? Okay, let's uh, get him to answer the question. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Let me explain something about this point. Uh, according to the Holy Quran, if you find some uh, people of scripture believe in God, believe in Prophet Muhammad as a good one, as a prophet, this is enough. We don't need more. Those people which we read in the so Holy Quran. So you're saying the Quran is open to interpretation on yes, this issue? Yes, yeah. yes. Some yes, sir, yes, sir, Kadi, do you agree with that? Well, <clears throat> I'd like to state here that this is a rather interesting position. So you're saying that there is this state between being a Christian and a Muslim, where there's a sympathetic Christian we're allowed to marry, and an unsympathetic Christian we're not allowed to marry? Is that, is that your basic premise? No, no, I'm, I'm looking for uh, someone. L let, me, let me explain more, please, one minute. Uh, explain more about how we have to deal with others, with non-Muslims. There is, Holy Quran said, Laysu sawa. There are not all alike. There are not all alike. There is some of them you have to consider them as a fr as a brothers, as a friend, and there is there is some of them you have to consider them as enemy. So this is the question uh, you have to ask him exactly. What exactly your faith with Prophet Muhammad? What exactly but your faith about With all due respect, Dr. Okay. Al-Habash, if somebody believes in the Prophet Muhammad, that is the definition of a Muslim. So if a Christian says, I believe in the Prophet Muhammad, he is a Muslim. I'd like to no, there's a lot. There's a lot who believe okay, in Prophet let, Muhammad. Let's hear from I, I, I just want to say that now I want to go back to what, the we're, what we're witnessing here right now is a window into the exact point that we need to be having. There is a side that is arguing for a literal interpretation of the Quran. Every religion has had this battle. Are we going to have a metaphorical and historical interpretation of the Quran, or are we going to have very literal interpretations that say, if you do this and only this, then you are a Muslim and you are acceptable? This issue that we're talking about tonight has wide ramifications. How are we going to look at Surah Al Nisa 434? the literal read that says that you can beat a wife lightly if you add the parenthetical phrase or that you should not, or the other verse that says you should not be a friend with the Jew and the Christian. This is why this kind of conversation needs to happen because this is the exact battle. Okay, all right, I'm going to take the conversation back to the question and ask you whether you got uh, an answer that convinced you, did you? Um, not really because I already know it's an established fact that the Muslim woman cannot and is essentially forbidden to marry a non-Muslim man and that, that's the case and I don't understand how you can well, go against is, the written word I mean, of God. This is, this is a battle we have though because if we believe that there is unanimity and there isn't, there is plenty of examples where there are dissenting opinions on every verse of the Quran including this important matter. Okay, saying, um, saying that we have a majority and unanimity does not make it so. Okay, I'm going to take a question from the lady in the second row there. We're concentrating... Um, Where are you from, um, from please? Syria. Uh, we're concentrating on the Muslim woman marrying a non-Muslim man. And I think the motion should extend to the fact in most of our Arabic subcontinent societies. She's not allowed to choose within the Muslim community. She is told 
who and where and what family and what level, etc., etc. So the restrictions are even greater than the motion much implies. Greater, mm -hmm. Much greater. And I think we need to expand the focus a little bit away from just the Muslim versus non-Muslim. Can, can I comment can I on this? Please, uh, that, yes, Akali. That's, let, that's let's exactly this. my point. I agree with you 110 percent. I'm the first person to agree with you that there is. Uh, uh, to, there, there are not enough opportunities for Muslim women to express their own desires to get married. I'm the first person to agree with you of racial prejudice, tribal prejudice, ethnic prejudice, but the motion is as it is, and it's simply too broad. Right, but the point that I'd like to make is that as soon as you start deciding that you have the right to create barriers, you impinge on a woman's right to free will. I disagree. And this is, this is my point is that it is not just about interfaith marriages. A Qatari woman can hardly choose to marry an Emirati man. I was told that I, God forbid, if I marry an African man or a black man. I mean, the prejudice in our community about who a woman marries extends beyond these interfaith issues. Okay, we, I, I wanna, I wanna hear from Saraya on the riot. I think we are mixing here between what came with the religion and comes under the umbrella of being Muslims right, and what came rights. with culture and social practices. Islam is for not example, on trial let her, let her For example, right. a woman, a female, has the right of veto. Family cannot force her to marry according to their will, exactly. no matter We're what she We're not discussing has. being forced. We're she, discussing right. being prevented. She can, yes, she can, uh, under religion, she can say no, and nobody can make her marry her cousin or her neighbor or the son of the ruler or anybody. Absolutely. If she says Absolutely. no, it's no. We've accepted but that. this is not practiced. Exactly the point. Not, not we, we have to be clear on what is under the umbrella of religion or made to appear like it is under the umbrella of religion. So which no. side of the argument are you A woman can on? choose. Myself? Yes. Definitely with the motion. Okay, I'm going to take a question from the lady right at the back. Yes, you. Thank you. We'll get a microphone to you. Good evening. Uh, my question is for where Dr. Are, where are you from, please? I'm from Lebanon. Uh, my question is for Dr. Thuraya. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Um, you stated that you believe that in, like in our age, any marriage would be based on um, physical desire. You don't think that uh, some ladies out there might actually Excuse me. Might actually be interested in, um, um, like, thinking of raising a family, even at this age, with also balancing their educational career and everything. I'm saying that the most active motivation at that age is physical, for both sexes, more for the men than for the women. So the attraction make it look like the right person. I would die if I didn't marry this person. And then you would die after you marry him within a period. Yeah. Well, let's be fair. Let's be fair. One or two work, don't they? So, so well, I'm saying they. Mm -hmm. But the attraction makes it look like the, you would never forget the person. You would never. You I mean, to listen to you, it's as if every marriage ends in doom and failure. Doesn't, a lot of doesn't. Can I do? Can I come a back? A lot of them, them do. Can I come back? Actually, but a lot of them do. I want to, I want to hear back so, from the question. So, for instance, I have in my life, like, I, I know two, two men, two young men. One who is very cute, and one who is very intelligent and smart, and has a, a very promising future. So, and I'm attracted to the cute guy. So, would you think I would go for the cute guy just because I'm physically attracted to him, or I, I would think, go for the I smart think. guy, because I want to secure a future? She's, a, she's asking for a little more credit. Yeah, no, no. No, actually, it is on the subconscious level. It's never on the conscious level, I like the Mr. Muscle. You know? It's not like that. You convince yourself that he has some other aspects. You're like, oh, he's cute. He is so smart. He answers all the questions in the class. He is the son of so and so. But basically, it's the physical attraction. Okay, all right, lady in the second row. Yes, you. Hi, I'm from uh, Qatar. Um, I believe in freedom for women. My question is for Azra Nomani. But I also believe in, I, I believe in complete freedom for women, but I believe in appropriate marriages as well. And I think in Muslim societies, we're very tight-knit, we're close with our families, we're close with our neighbors. So 
if the girl chooses to marry anyone she likes, and she goes for an amar a marriage that she knows is inappropriate, but she says all she needs is love, all she needs is that she knows him, she's going to be isolated, she's going to be unhappy, and the future consequences are going to weigh in a lot heavier than the actual immediate satisfaction of, I married someone I love. What good is it that you're married to someone you love if your family's not speaking to you? What good is it you're marrying someone you love if at the end of the day you can't she herself will be embarrassed to be in that marriage because she knows it's inappropriate, because she knows it's not going to work, and she knows it doesn't fit in the context of the society. So how do you reconciliate that? So to me, the reconciliation is not to limit a woman's free will then and to limit her choices. The reconciliation is for us as families to give women and to give each other unconditional love, to allow people their choices and let them be different, perhaps, allow yourself to disagree. We're never going to agree on the choice. The motion is not what, whether the woman has made a good choice. It is about her free will to make the choice. Okay, yes, Akadi, you want to come in Nobody here. on this table is, is asking for women's rights to be taken away. Nobody on this table is asking for forced marriages. We're asking right. for limited responsibility within, the, the, within uh, what the Sharia allows. It's that simple. What I heard from you was that you said that if you don't accept these laws as you've prescribed them to be interpreted, then don't call yourself a Muslim. And don't ascribe I mean, the laws to Islam. I never said leave the faith. Mm, I said don't you, ascribe... You basically, don't. you basically did the same kind of ideological intimidation that women face when they are turned away from their family. You said, leave then. Don't call yourself a Muslim. If the you same, don't follow the these same laws, applies to men. If a man, sure, wanted, this, if a man wanted to marry another man, right. I'm not saying he's a non-Muslim. I say, don't bring religion into it. This don't right, say this is And this right should extend to men as well. I mean, too many men are also the denied their rights. The motion is too right. broad. It's that simple. We the all notion, agree that women should have more rights. The motion is too okay, broad. Okay, we, we can all have a go at the motion, but I want to go back to the questioner for a moment and ask, uh, can, I, can I ask you, you're, you're not married. I'm not married, no. What factors will you weigh up when you make your decision to get married? Religion? Family? Well, government? religion obviously for me is, th there's no, I'm, I will marry a Muslim. For me, I want to marry from the Gulf because I believe that cultures need to be similar. I, if, I feel that if I marry someone from a culture that is way too different, it's just going to be upsetting for everybody, including myself, because I'm very close with my family, I love my family, and I want them to come and to receive me and my husband well. I don't want them to feel like And if you awkward. fell in love with somebody who wasn't from the Gulf, would you think it appropriate for the government to step in and tell you that you can't marry them? Well, what governments do is, for me, the government is, again, a safety net as well. I don't think it's right for them to say no, but at the same time, I believe in taking responsibility for yourself and making decisions that you know are appropriate. Torea, all right. That's one sane young woman. Mm -hmm. I like what you said. I really like what you said. You know, every, every boundary or difference between the two sides of marriage creates problems, regardless of what you convince yourself. Language creates a problem, religion creates a problem, being from a different tribe creates a problem, being not liked by your family creates a problem. Now, if you want to stand up all your life defending your marriage against all these problems. And You're not choice. going to have a happy So you're saying marriage. choose the easy way out? Yes, choose the happy way out. And the happy way out, the easy way yes. Okay, I think it's time we heard from a man. <laughs> Gentleman in the fifth row. I'm from Egypt and uh, teaching at Qatar University Islamic Studies. Uh, I think you cannot have it both ways. You cannot have, okay, I'm a Muslim, but at the same time, I'm not going to follow the rules of Islam. So either you follow the rules of Islam with, within these parameters, or you do what you like, okay. and there is no compulsion at the end of the day. Mohammed Habash, you, yes. you want to make a point here? Yes, uh, I was talking about the religious issues. According to our understanding in Islam, we believe that Islam is the religion of all, the religion of all prophets. That means Christian and Jews can be Muslims, but if, if they, if they uh, respect Prophet Muhammad peace upon him, according to my understanding, we have to struggle against monopoly of salvation. We have to struggle against monopoly of God. We have to struggle against monopoly of reality. God is one, but his names are many. Reality is one, but its ways are many. Spirituality is one, but religions are many. The love is one, but hearts are many. Uh, with this situation, yes, I, I'm, I'm not 
looking to force others to convert to Islam. No, this is their choice. But I have to be clear. I cannot allow Islamic ladies to uh, marry someone who believe your prophet is liar. How can, how can find good life with this? But if he said, I'm ready to respect your life, to respect your religion, to respect your prophet, to respect your faith, I believe this is enough. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, this is not acceptable in Islam. She cannot marry a non-Muslim. Under Islam, she cannot marry a non-Muslim. He has to become a Muslim. My dear, that if, is if, if, no, please don't everybody speak. Kind. Please don't everybody speak. Dear, dear, you've said he, something. He said, I now you reply. No God but Allah and Prophet Muhammad is messenger of God. He's a Muslim. This is enough. This is enough. This is enough. Now we have some religious Christian leader here. If he said, I'm ready to believe the Prophet Muhammad as a prophet of God, I believe this is enough. With all I'm, respect, I'm not looking with all, for, please, for more with, details. With all due respect, we're on the wrong side of the table. That's okay. exactly what I would say as well. All right, I'm going to go to a gentleman in the second row in the blue shirt, please. You, sir. Hi, I'm Palestinian. Higher education continues to become more and more common um, across the region, and women constitute a majority of the consumers of ed higher education. If higher education opens and expands horizons, then how can we reconcile these expanded horizons with these glass ceilings that are placed in the name of religion? Yes, Akadi. Well, higher education in and of itself has nothing to do with definitions of religion. We will not change definitions of religion based upon higher education. If somebody doesn't want to believe in the Prophet Muhammad, he can have 10 PhDs, he's not a Muslim. It doesn't matter, it's, it's a, you're comparing apples and oranges. Islam has already been defined. And what I'm talking about are universals, not the fine gray areas that Asr and others are bringing up. And of these definitions, a Muslim lady cannot marry a non-Muslim man, nor can she marry a lady. That's all I'm arguing for. The point here is not about the merits of her choice. The point is whether she has the right to make her own that's choice. Not, that, is the, that is the that is the right. Is she free to make any choice that she wishes? What, tell me, if, she, if your daughter one day comes to you and says, I'm going to marry a Christian man, what are you going to do? Are you going to jail her? Are you going to punish her? Are you going to throw her out of the faith? Or is she entitled as a human being to make that choice? I hope that the education I would give my daughter right, would be would obviously okay, prevent her from doing that. Doesn't. But in North that's, America, okay, in the American answer, context, please. in the American context, there's, answer, there's nothing that I can do. But she will be educated enough to know that this is not a part of the religion, no matter what she does. That's, that's Don't a cop mix out. religion that's into a cop her personal out. choice. That's a cop out because ultimately he isn't accounting for individual choice. You know, and I I want to say just very quickly to the young women in the audience, I don't go along with any of this belittling of your minds that's happening here. I find it offensive and I find it um, actually contrary to the teachings of the Prophet because when young women came to him, he did not mock them, he did not ask them why they choose not to be in the marriages that they are wanting to leave. He respected and honored their decision without any condition. Okay. And that right. conditionality is not... Yes, Akadi, do you practice. want to come back on that? No conditions is no right. boundaries. No boundaries is no religion. It's that simple. Free will means that you have all the options and that is what it means to be a human being. But not That's a Muslim. A Muslim means to submit. And what do you submit to? You submit to the laws of God. Okay, I'm going to move on. To your okay. version okay. of the laws Thank you. of God. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to move on. The gentleman behind you. Um, two rows behind you, sir. Yeah. I'm Lebanese, and uh, I'm a Christian, and I will address the cultural debate that's been going on. Um, where I come from, the society, society in Lebanon is much more lax than, let's say, in the Gulf. And so many individuals, men and women from different faiths, have ended up you know, getting married to each other. And it hasn't, me it hasn't been much of an issue. And I think the reason for that is because of culture. And for Dr. Thureya, as a psychologist, she should know that problems of individuals you know, spread out to society. And society is made out from individuals. I'm not a psychologist. Actually, I'm a long-range planner. So I know what, may, what future means. You do not make a decision on the basis of now because in the future you will face the consequences. You want to get married and she's in front of you. She has the basic qualifications. <laughs> that is not enough because in the end you have to live with other things. 
You have to live with her parents. It's a package deal. You have to live with, with everything. In, in fact, what you said about changing the society is true, but you don't do it one by one. It has to be enough change in the whole thinking. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to take a question from a lady in the back row. One from the back. Yes, you. Good evening. I'm Muslim, and I'm a young woman. I'm educated, as you say. I've been educated Where are you by from, my. Please? I'm from Mauritius. I've been educated by my parents. I've been brought up within the Muslim culture, and I find it extremely frustrating that you are underestimating our intelligence to such an extent that you believe that we, as young Muslims, cannot be responsible for our choices. We have been educated by our parents in the Muslim religion, and therefore we should be able to make our choice in a responsible manner according to what we have been taught and what we believe is true. you make the right choice, you get the green light. The family does not say no. If no. you made the right choice, they will not fight you. You are assuming that, so that the family it's a fam is family enough to respect our choice. It's Here so it's a family differences, even in the same country, even under the same religion. One family does, one family doesn't. It has nothing to do with the religion. Can you address her point? What if the family, what is the right decision? To agree with her? No, it seems on what basis? Not. No, it, the right decision seems to be to agree no, with you. No, I want to know what, what do you wait, think is the right... Let speak for herself. Wait, yeah. what is the right decision? That well, they agree with your side? When, when I was growing up, my father said to me, you make your bed and you lie on it. Exactly. So I believe that I make decisions for which I am responsible. Mm -hmm. And my father trusted me to make the right decision. Okay. However, had he not be, been that enlightened, then I am sure, being the person I am, I would have gone against his, his decision. And, and because I know that I am responsible and educated enough mm -hmm. to bear the consequences of my decision. Yeah. And I believe that I'm, as a Muslim, we are free. And, and I'm tired of hearing people saying that Muslim women have no rights, etc., etc., etc. We do. We are intelligent enough. We are educated enough. Why shouldn't we I have agree. the right to make our own decisions? I am a Muslim woman. I, may I respond to that? Please do. I'm also a Muslim woman, and I don't think I'm dumb. I don't, I'm not saying Muslim women are dumb and cannot make their choices. I'm saying if you have a conflict with the family, one side is right, one side is wrong. You are better off if you listen. This motion is very emotional and it's very complex and it's pretty obvious to all of us here that each one of us has a unique position. However the verdict goes, I'm happy we started the conversation. I just want to say that the point is that none of you as women, I hope, will ever believe that you are alone. You have at least in me an auntie who will come to your wedding if you decide to do something. That's that a lot is, of weddings. I know. <laughs> Because it is going to take courage. It's going to take courage on individual levels to challenge so many of these traditions that decide that they are going to control women and patronize them and diminish their intellect in the minds of society. Okay, I'm going to take one more brief question. Gentleman in the fourth row. You, sir. Yes, you. Uh, my question is for Mr. Yasser. You must have said this like ten times through a debate. Everything that you said, you said because of unanimous consensus and at the beginning of the debate you mentioned that unanimous consensus was the strongest tool of making Sharia law or Islamic rules. Correct me if I'm mistaken, I'm a Muslim myself and I've studied just a tiny little bit of Islamic law and according to what I studied that the priority is Quran, Hadith, precedent and then unanimous consensus. And when you say unanimous consensus, can you define what is unanimous consensus? How many people have to agree to something, does anybody count? Unanimous consensus is stronger than an interpretation of the verse of the Quran because it shows that everybody has understood that verse the same way. 
That's why unanimous consensus is considered to be stronger than any interpretation. As for unanimous consensus, how it's defined, it's defined where each and every of the major scholars of any time period have agreed about the same ruling. And to be honest, there's not that many decisions that are unanimously agreed upon. Of them, according to five authorities that I have here, which are going to be too troublesome to mention, of them is the fact that a Muslim lady cannot engage in a marriage contract with a non-Muslim man at that time. So this you're is saying that if at the end of agreement. tonight, if 70% of people in this room vote yes for the motion, that's the unanimous consensus? No, unanimous means there is unanimity. That means everybody agrees with it. And once unanimous consensus has been reached, it cannot be abrogated after that. Well, well the man who, who reads Friday prayers at the Azapa Mosque in Damascus doesn't agree with you. Well, actually, he has a position which is kind of sort of in between. This idea that is coming from that side is the exact ideology that wants us all to think the same. It wants us all to interpret Islam according to their rule book. And our challenge as human beings is to use our minds to be able to say what is best for myself because God is the judge, not individuals. Okay, we could go on for hours on this, but, but we have come to the point, excuse me, we have come to the point, thank you, we've come to the point where we're going to vote on this motion, that this house believes that Muslim women should be free to marry anyone they choose. Would you please take your voting machines, and let me explain how they work, if you want to vote for the motion, that is the side represented by Asra Namani and Mohammed Habash, you press button one, the yes button. If you want to vote against the motion, the side represented by Yasser Qadi and Thuraya al arayed you press button two, the no button, and whichever one you want, would you press it now, please? Right. There is the vote. The vote is 62% for the motion, 38% against. The motion has been carried. All it remains for me to do is to thank our distinguished panelists very much for coming here tonight. Thank you very much. To you, the audience, as well, thank you for your questions and participation. The Doha debates will be back again in October. Till then, have a good summer and a safe journey home. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Good night.